Sam Carcitti, you're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Yeah, this is for Chuck. Chuck, first of all, how, how difficult was it um, or, or is it to put together this uh, expansion protected list? And the second part, uh, what did you learn from the Vegas draft when you were with Minnesota uh, and how will it have any effect at all on how you approach this draft with Seattle? Uh, well, Sam, um, you know, first of all, I think we have a, you know, we have our expansion draft list uh, put together, you know, um, if we make uh, moves between now and then we'll, we can adjust it obviously, but we have a pretty good idea of what, uh, we want to do and who we're going to protect and who we'll make available. So, you know, we had uh, for this expansion draft, we had more time uh, than we did versus the Vegas draft and, uh, you know, more time to um, make sure we had all the, uh, all the holes filled and we met all the criteria that we needed to meet. And, and uh, so, you know, from that standpoint, it's been, been a little simpler, the, the, you know, the pandemic and the flat cap has made it probably more difficult because the cap, Obviously, there's cap pressures on teams, so Seattle uh, will certainly have an opportunity there to talk to teams about helping them out with their cap issues in exchange for various assets. So we'll see how that plays out, and, and, and Seattle, I'm sure, will have good options. They've, they've worked hard, but, uh, but you know, I think we had a little bit more time to plan for this one, and we're, we feel like we're in good shape. Dan, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, is there anything though, that you learned from, from the first draft, from the – uh, from the draft with Vegas, like uh, uh, maybe uh, that would affect you and your decisions this time. No, not not necessarily. Uh, you know, the every situation's different. Uh, our team in Minnesota was a lot different than uh, you know the team here in terms of the makeup and the composition of of, of the players. So, you know, I think uh, your goal is always to to do the best thing for, for the organization. And, and uh, in, in our case here now, we, uh, you know, our, I think our decisions, um, we had pretty good unanimity of, of what we wanted to do when we had our pro scouts in town. And so I think it's, it, it's uh, a process that may be a little bit more experienced, but we had more time to prepare. So again, I think our list is pretty straightforward. Charlie O'Connor, you're on with Chuck and Brent, go ahead. Hey guys, this is for uh, for Chuck um, again about the expansion draft. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned about um, you know the protection and about you know potentially with asset trades and whatnot. D do you think it's likely that you might look to to work out a side deal with them to steer them in a specific direction? Or are you more leaning towards just submitting your list and letting them pick and choose with who you leave available? Uh, I'm open to either. Um, you know, I've had several conversations with Ron going back a few months now, and you know it's. Uh, we'll probably take guidance for them if there's something that they think would make sense for them and, and, and uh, would make sense for us. Uh, but, you know, my, my expectation is we'll, we'll submit the list and if uh, whether there'll be conversations after we submit the list or not, uh, time will tell, but we're, we're, we're certainly comfortable just submitting the list and having them select a player. And, and I've just indicated to them if they have uh, ideas on something else they want to accomplish to, to let us know. Steve Wino, you're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Hey, Chuck. I'm just curious. What do you? What is the chatter for for you and for other GMs right now? And Ken Holland said, unless you're talking to Ron Francis, there's not a lot going on kind of right now. He's anticipating waiting till the expansion draft for stuff to happen. Is that a fair read on what's going on right now? Uh, you know, it's probably every team's different. I, you know, I've I've certainly. Uh, the phones have been busy. Uh, I've been receiving calls. I've been making calls. So we're, we're all speaking with each other. Uh, you know, it's uh, every team's in a little bit different spot for some teams. They can acquire a player now and it doesn't impact their, their list that much. There's other teams that would much rather wait till after the expansion draft to make a trade uh, to upgrade their club. So, um, you know, I, th I think everybody's different. Um, it seems like more teams are, you know, would prefer to wait until after uh, Seattle makes their decisions. But there is a lot of dialogue and teams are, uh, I think, trying to get a read of the room right now to see who's available, uh, what teams are, you know, what other teams are trying to do and uh, what options we, we all may have once we get uh, get closer to the draft and free agency. So uh, a lot of, a lot of chatter, but yeah, you know, from our standpoint, we certainly aren't 
going to be making a trade today or tomorrow unless something unexpected breaks right now. Jordan Hall, you're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Hi, Chuck. Hi, Brent. Uh, this hey, is from Chuck. Uh, Chuck, I was wondering, have, have you informed the players that you plan on exposing in the expansion draft? And if so, um, is there an awkwardness to that conversation or is it just as business as possible? I haven't officially if informed them. I've had conversations with, with a few of them, um, several uh, conversations with, with a couple of them about the likelihood of it and about what we're trying to do and why. Um, you know, again, if we it, you know, as we get closer to, to Saturday, whether it's Friday or Saturday, I, I will reach out to some of the players for sure to give them a, a courtesy heads up. But, you know, things could still change. So I don't I don't want to jump the gun too much. But there, I think a few of them are aware of what our position is and, and um, you, you know, and, and we've had good conversations. Bill Meltzer, you're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, hi, guys. I actually have a question for both of you. I'll start with Chuck. Um, Chuck, how are you looking at these next few weeks in terms of being crunch time for being proactive for major moves you may make in the offseason versus taking a long view of having the entire offseason until when rosters have to be filed to, you know, make changes to the team? You know, this summer to me is, is similar to, to every summer, uh, every offseason you know, the goal is to, to try to be as competitive as we can next year. And, and, and yet we want to make sure we, we keep uh, a large quantity of, of future assets that we can continue to, uh, you know, that, that can continue to help us get better as we move forward. So uh, we're looking at everything. Um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's an exciting time in a sense that uh, with, with the Seattle expansion draft, with, with the flat cap, um, you might see, uh, you know, maybe a few more trades, a few more hockey trades throughout the league. Um, the draft is always an exciting time. You know, we're picking higher than where we want to pick, but yet, the, you know, we're having the 13th selection will give us an opportunity to get a pretty good player. So there's going to be some, I think, you know, hopefully some exciting additions to our club over the next couple of months. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, probably a few moves around the league that you normally wouldn't see because of expansion and because of the flat cap. So, uh, you know, we're, we're going to continue to try to make moves that make us better. And, and uh, you know, we know we have a lot of work ahead of us and, and uh, we'll, we'll do the best we can. Bill, did you have a follow up? I do. This question is for Brent. Um, Brent, when you when you look at the draft this year, I think one of the things that makes it interesting is uh, you have two very highly rated goaltenders that, uh, you know, potentially could fall into that top 10 to top 15 range. Uh, do, you, do you see... Do you, do you see that playing in potentially to where, you know, who you might pick as your best available player, whether it's one of the goalies or somebody who might slide you as a result? Yeah, possibly. It's uh, it's going to be a really interesting draft. I think, uh, you know, like it's probably been written about, I think the top eight or nine guys, I think teams will have them in different orders, but it's probably going to be the same names. And uh, what you're going to see is it, it goes all over the board. I think there's a, a number of players that probably media outlets and whatnot have not seen a lot of, uh, but teams have, teams have done their homework on certain players. Uh, some players haven't played at all this year, uh, which is unique uh, for us and for everybody. Uh, so you're going to see some, some variants as the draft uh, expands. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're going to be working up right through next week to finalize everything and tighten everything up, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Sam Carcitti, you're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Yeah, this is for Chuck. Chuck, you have uh, some players who have uh, big contracts. Does that make it easier for you not to protect them in the expansion draft? Well, I think right now with, with the flat cap, it's it's uh, it's difficult to to uh, you know to move players with high salaries in, in general. Um, you know, but I I don't know if it makes it easier for the list or not. I mean. Ultimately, you know, Seattle's coming in with with uh, with zero cap dollars, so certainly they have the ability to, to add good players regardless of, of contract if, if, if they choose. So I think you, you're always trying to, um, you know, make decisions where you're protecting the players you feel you need to protect for for the short and long term good of your franchise. And and uh, but I think generally speaking, in this environment, um, it goes without saying it, it, it's, uh, it's difficult to move money right now. And, and 
you know, cheaper contracts are, are probably uh, uh, more valuable in that sense. Follow up, Sam. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if this is for Chuck or Brent, uh, whoever feels comfortable answering. Uh, as far as the draft, is your number one draft pick uh, in play for uh, a trade or do you want to keep it? Um, sure. Depends, yeah. depends who you ask. Yeah, yeah. Brent <laughs> wants me to keep it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I look. It, it's it's a good, it's a really good asset. If we if we pick use our first round pick to select a player, we're obviously going to be able to draft a, a high quality player that that that'll help us. And uh, but yet because it's you know it, it, it's of high asset value, I think we we have to explore what we can do with it. So you know the the likelihood is you you normally end up keeping your first round picks, but I, I think. Um, this soft season in particular, I think I'm more willing to, to look at moving it. And, and uh, there's some way we can help our team, not just in the short term, but more over several years, over the longer term. And it, it cost me uh, the first round pick. If I can get that type of asset, I'll certainly look at doing it. Charlie O'Connor, you're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Hey, this is for Chuck, uh, and it's more of a more of an overarching question about the offseason. Uh, going back to March when we talked to you with regards to the, the blue line core, you talked about how you thought the makeup of the group as a whole probably wasn't right. You needed to address that going forward. Does that still remain a top priority for you this summer now that you've had the opportunity to you know talk with the coaches, talk with the staff as a whole in terms of your offseason meetings? Well, you know, I think there's been a lot of focus on the blue line. I mean, to me, the, the number one priority is our, our goals against. It was just ridiculous how many goals we gave up last year. That goes back to everything. It goes back to the coaches having a great training camp and using the practice time early in the season to reinforce our systems and our structure. It's, it's our goaltenders playing better. It's our defensemen playing better. It's our forwards managing the puck better. Uh, we need a, you know, we're, we're going to need to, look at upgrades to our roster. There's no question. And we're also going to need the, the players that are returning to play better uh, in particular without the puck and structurally uh, we're going to need our coaches to, to get our players back and uh, you know, again, back in that structure and reinforce the system. So, you know, it's not just one thing that led us to, to fall from seventh in the league defensively to the bottom of the pile. And, uh, but I, you have no chance, no chance to win in this league unless you're, at least in the top half of the league defensively. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, again, we have holes we need to fill and we have players that are currently on a roster that need to play much better. And it's gotta be a holistic approach. It, it's not just one player that's gonna turn it around. It's, it's everybody starting with me that has to be much better this year. And, and uh, that has been conveyed to, to everybody in the organization. Ed Barkowitz, you're all with Chuck and Brent, go ahead. Hey, Chuck, you mentioned it uh, very briefly about the pandemic. Uh, does that factor into your decision? Uh, you, you had a lot of younger players who, who didn't play as well uh, this season. Does that factor into your evaluation, uh, uh, the pandemic and, and all the challenges that brought this year? It's a bit. I mean, it, again, it's hard to say for sure what caused some of our young players not to play at the same level. I mean, the pandemic would be one logical reason. Um, you know, maybe expectations for some of them coming off a strong year and just assuming, uh, you know, you'd be able to come back and do the same thing. Uh, you know, I, I do think it's, it, it certainly is a reason to give pause. It, you know, I think uh, some of our young players, at least in my opinion, are better than how they performed last year. And, and I think you need to be a little bit careful overreacting to, to one year, particularly one year as crazy as last year was. Uh, yet we know they have to be better and, uh, and we have to be better. So uh, I don't know that we're, you know, I think we just want to be a little bit careful here. We've worked hard as an organization for the last seven, eight years to patiently add and draft and develop a lot of young players. And it's kind of been the focus of the franchise you know, going back to 2014, probably you got to be a little bit careful that you don't change course and, and, and start, uh, moving by good young players that maybe struggled for a little bit last year. We have to find a way to make them better. Uh, we have to get better and, and we'll work very hard at that. And, uh, you know, we've spent, um, we'll probably get into this later on in the summer, but spend an awful lot of time this summer looking at our, our, our staff, our, our structure, um, 
and, and I think we've made some really meaningful changes and, and improvements to how we do things, uh, not just from a coaching standpoint, but from a development standpoint, a scouting standpoint, a data standpoint. And uh, I, I think, um, you know, we, we put a lot of time and effort this summer into to fixing some things off the ice that we think will lead to better on ice results. So again, we've looked at everything last year was unacceptable. Um, it's been a busy off season uh, behind the scenes and, and I'm really happy with some of the moves we've made. And uh, now we have to find a way to get better on the ice and that'll be the focus from here on out. Jordan Hall, you're on with Chuck and Brent, go ahead. Hi guys, uh, this is for Chuck. Chuck, just wondering, have you zeroed in on candidates for for your assistant position on the big club staff and the two assistants down in Lehigh Valley? Yeah, we've we've made a lot of uh, personnel moves that uh, we'll announce in short order. Um, but we, yeah, we've, uh, I mean, spent two months doing this stuff, so we're uh, we will have a lot of changes to announce here in, in the new in the, in the near future. Um, but we've. Uh, Work pretty hard at that. We're, I think we're in a pretty good position going forward. Adam Kimmelman, you're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, this is for Chuck. Um, Chuck, I want to go back to what you said about the 13, the number 13 pick possibly being in play. Is there a certain type of elite player, a certain position that you're focused on? If, if a player of one position comes up, maybe a defenseman that you consider moving it for, or are other areas of need that you would consider you know, moving that pick for it. And it has to be in a, a certain elite type of player. Well, I think the second part of it would be the, the more important part. Um, you know, if you're going to move the 13th overall pick, you know, either by itself or as part of a package, you better be getting a, you know, a really good player that can help you for, for a few years. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that it has to be position specific, uh, but um, certainly you want to make sure you're, you're getting a good player that can, that can help you in the short and long term. Gary Santaniello, you're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, Chuck. Good morning, Brent. This question is for both of you. The, uh, you know, as we've seen from Cole, uh, Kale McCarr and uh, Cole Caulfield, you know, a second year of college really helped them. And, you know, you signed Cam York after his second year. With regards to Cam, what difference did you notice in his second year, year of play? And generally, what benefit do you see from a college player staying for a second year? I can handle it. Um, well, first of all, for every player is different. Uh, especially in coming up after you draft them, uh, both physical maturity, mental maturity. Um, obviously, staying in college for an extra year is is beneficial in a lot of cases. Some players are ready after their freshman year, but uh, playing another year of college never hurts. And I think in Cam's case, uh, in particular, it allowed him to to grow physically. Uh, he got invaluable experience coming in, playing some games in the American League, <clears throat> getting his feet wet in the NHL at the end of the year. Uh, to see where he needs to get to physically and uh, to see how playing in the NHL every day uh, at work. So uh, Cam is a, obviously a very intelligent player. Uh, his his skill set is, is, is very good. Um, but knowing now for him to what he needs to do this off season to get ready for this year is uh, it should be, you know, has really helped him and has prepared for his off season here. Sam Carcidi, you're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Yeah, th this is for Brent. Brent, um, how would you characterize this draft overall as far as strengths and, and uh, weaknesses? That's the first part. And in the past, I know you've always gone for the best player in the draft in the first round. Is that uh, still the strategy this year? Uh, well, first of all, this draft, I, I think it's been uh, well publicized. I don't think there's any generational players in it. Uh, however, there are some quality players at the top end. And there is some depth throughout the draft. There's, uh, there's some different tiers like every year. And um, you know, our group has done a pretty good job identifying those. But I do think there's some depth through the second, third round this year that our guys are uh, excited about and, and even beyond. So um, we'll continue to work through that uh, this and next week and, and we'll be ready for next Friday. Um, and then as far as the uh, uh, strengths of the draft, I, you know, I think there's, you know, there's some quality defensemen at the top of the draft. There's some quality centermen. 
Um, there's wingers, there's, you know, it's publicized. There's a couple goalies that'll likely get into the first round here. So it uh, should be an interesting week to see how it plays out. Charlie O'Connor, you're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Yeah, this is for Brent, and this is kind of a follow-up to a question you were asked earlier. Uh, Bill mentioned about the, the the goalie prospect. You just mentioned about them in the first round. You know, they might be available at 13 if you guys keep the pick. But, you know, obviously you have Carter as a, a young starting goalie at the NHL level, even though he you know, didn't have a great year. Would the presence of Carter in the organization make it less likely you take a goalie at that spot, or does that not really matter and play into the decision? Uh. No, I think we have, you know, we have Carter, obviously the young goalie. We have a couple of goalies outside the NHL that we feel have a chance uh, as good prospects. But no, if he, it's the best, you know, it's the next best player on our board, we'll we'll certainly consider it and, and take him. But at the same time, we we have, uh, you know, we have a number of different players and positions that we'll we'll look at as well. So, uh, but no, we're not opposed if it's clearly the next best player on our draft board, we'll we'll take that. And to Sam's so, question earlier, like. Uh, as far as position, uh, we don't really draft by position, especially in the first round. We go by our list, um, the best player available. And, and realistically, as you've seen in the NHL, a lot of these players don't play next year. So sometimes our needs right now are changed by uh, two years down the road. So uh, that's just the reality we're in. Joe Fordyce, you're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Hi, this question is for Chuck. Um, when you were talking about how the, the the kind of the calm nature of the beginning of the off season earlier. Um, and then you see a move yesterday, like Chicago makes to trade Duncan Keith. Is there kind of a trickle down effect, like uh, almost innate pressure to, okay, this got the ball rolling. So let's, you know, re this really got the ball rolling in the off season. We need to, um, we need to get moving here. Is that kind of a natural reaction to the first big move of the off season? Uh you know, I think that move was probably a little bit different. That was a, you know, I think it's the player player had reasons for wanting to go and there was certain teams he would go to and, and, and two teams were able to make a trade, but I, I don't know if it's as much that I think it's just the timing of everything between the expansion draft and the, you know, the entry draft follow, you know, following that a few days later, and then the start of free agency, we have all the big events, um, you know, that may and may involve player movement really happening within literally a 10 or 12 day period. So, you know, once you get past the first day of, of free agency, the amount of player uh, players that are available and the amount of cap space that's available will probably be much more limited. So I think, you know, there, there's, I guess, pressure in the sense that uh, if you have moves you want to make, this is when you got to try to make them. And having said all that, it, it again, it's, um, somebody asked this question or brought this point up earlier in, in this type of environment where there's not a lot of liquidity in the system, it's a flat cap system. It's um, moves are a little trickier in part because of the expansion draft, but uh, you know, there's not a, a lot of teams that are just able to take on a lot of money. So it, it's, it, there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot of communication about dollar for dollar type of moves, or can you take some money back or can you do this? So it makes it a little bit more complicated, but, in saying that over the next two weeks, my guess is the majority of player movement that happens this summer will take place. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Charlie O'Connor, you're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, this is for Chuck, and again, a little bit more bigger picture. You know, you talked about the importance of you know the younger players having you know a much better season than they did last year for the you know for the most part. Um, one thing you talked about in your postseason press conference was the importance of you know workouts, training in the off season, the struggles that some guys had you know with the challenge of the pandemic last off season. I guess, what are you guys doing to, to ensure working with those guys to make sure that doesn't happen again? And, and are, are guys going to be maybe coming back to Philly earlier to, to make sure that, uh, you know, that they don't run into those same issues again? Uh, well, in terms of the first part of the question, Charlie, we, you know, we have our strength coaches, um, you know, worked with the players before they left in terms of the, the summer program they'll follow. Most of our players have, have trainers that they train with during the off season. It, it, it seems to be a fact of life now for most pro athletes. And this summer, obviously gyms are, are open and trainers are able to train uh, 
the players in person where, you know, last uh, off season was maybe a little bit more problematic in, in some locations. So, uh, but the players have a good idea of what's expected of them. Uh, our strength coaches stay in touch with them. Uh, our team nutritionist has reached out to them. And uh, so we, we stay in contact with them regularly uh, through the summer. And uh, as the summer moves on, our coaches will follow up with them. So there, there's a lot of follow up and, and these guys are professionals. They know what they need to do. Uh, they will work hard. And, and again, I think it'll be easier for every athlete, not just our, our players to, to have access to ice rinks and gyms and, and everything that maybe in, in, in the previous off season uh, was more limited. So, uh, you know, there's a pretty good plan in place for that. In terms of guys coming back early, that's really up to them. I know some of the players, uh, you know, Shane Goss is obviously here. Provorov has been here for a while, and then he just went back uh, back home. Uh, we'll have some players that will come in and uh, as the summer moves on and and uh, and train here. But that's that's really up to them. And uh, my expectation is by Labor Day we'll have a, a lot of people here and uh, in terms of our veteran players. But, uh, you know, typically – it's pretty quiet around here in July for the veteran players. We'll do two more questions. Sam Carcitti, you're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Yeah, this is for uh, Chuck. Uh, are there, is there any progress being made in uh, negotiations with uh, your RFA, specifically Carter Hart, Nolan Patrick, and Travis Sanheim? And then the second part, uh, do you have interest in re-signing uh, or have you talked with uh, UF, the UFAs, Sam Moran, uh, Brian Elliott, and Alex Lyon? Uh, I, I don't know that I really want to get into um, updates on, on signings. Usually try to keep that stuff pretty quiet. I, I will say with the RFAs, it hasn't been um, a front burner issue. There's plenty of time uh, to, to get to those. We have to make the qualifying offers by the Monday after the draft. And and uh, we'll make those sometime between now and then. And, and then typically the, the ball gets rolling uh, from, from there. I mean, I've, I've had some preliminary talks with a few of the guys you've mentioned. But uh, at this point, um, again, we have time and, and uh, we'll, we'll get to those in due course. Last question, Steve Wino. You're on with Chuck and Brent. Go ahead. Hey, Chuck, I apologize for the wacky question. I don't know if you saw the, the damage the Stanley Cup took uh, yesterday. I, I don't know if when you had your celebration with the Penguins in, in 09 or with your dad in, in 89, do you ever remember worrying about that or, 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 or damaging it in any way? <laughs> well, in 89, um, I know uh, the tradition of, of, of everybody getting the cup for a day wasn't, I, I don't think was in, in force back in 89, but I remember we did have the cup and, and my dad brought it to, uh, to a couple local hospitals and, and uh, we, we had a, a friend that was in a hospital at the time. So we, I remember bringing the cup there, but certainly there weren't a lot of shenanigans with, with the cup back then, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I've heard, I've heard various stories over the year, but uh, I don't have any recollections of, uh, of doing that, but uh, certainly um, it looked like they had a lot of fun yesterday. Okay, Chuck, Brent, thank you very much for your time this morning. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, everyone, that concludes the Flyers media availability. Uh, be on the lookout later this afternoon for recordings and audio and transcript coming your way. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.